Freeside is the main slum of New Vegas, a dangerous, destitute settlement that contains many of FNV's best quests and characters. However, the way it appears in the final game is a mere shadow of Obsidian's intentions. A significant amount of the area's content was cut, and much of what was completed is plagued by bugs that were never fixed. Even some of what appears in the initial release would later be patched out. This is Freeside's development and cut content. In the final game, Freeside is sectioned off into multiple areas, but it started out as a single massive world space. It was easily one of the largest and most ambitious locations in the core game, only rivaled by the Strip itself. Like the Strip, concrete walls and guard towers like those found at Camp McCarran once surrounded Freeside. The gate leading into the Strip was also significantly different than how it looks in the final release. Concept art shows piles of cars stacked against the exterior wall of New Vegas, so it was probably meant to appear this way in-game. It wasn't just a larger area though. The designers envisioned Freeside as a densely populated urban sprawl, filled with NPCs of varying factions, and that's best depicted in the All Roads cover art. The streets of Freeside are shown overflowing with characters from all walks of life, from rich gamblers to poor refugees, mercenaries, thugs, chem dealers, kings, and everything in between. Sadly, the sheer size of Freeside and the number of NPCs cause crippling frame rates. The complexity of the area combined with the instability of Bethesda's engine also made crashes much more frequent. These issues were most prevalent on the console versions, but even a mid-range PC in 2010 would have struggled to run a populated Freeside. At some point, it became clear to the dev team that their plans for the area, what they had spent so much time designing and creating, was simply impossible. Due to similar issues, the strip was broken up by gates to limit sightlines and reduce the number of NPCs used at any given time, but it remained as a single world space. Freeside wasn't so lucky, and the developers were forced to split it into three separate areas. The main area was cut in half, and the gates to the Old Mormon Fort were closed. As the player travels between these areas, they're exploring completely different, unrelated maps. The part of Freeside where the Atomic Wrangler and Strip Gate are found is the original Freeside world space. The bus gate was added in, and everything beyond it was cut. This was then copied into the new Freeside North world space, which includes the Old Mormon Fort, Mick and Ralph's, Cerulean Electronics, and the train station. Many of the streets that once connected the city together were walled off, and as a result, navigating it became much less intuitive. If you no-clip through the bus gate and into the cut section of Freeside, you can see the Old Mormon Fort gate is still open. This is one of the only in-game remnants from when Freeside was still a single area. Lead world builder Scott Everts commented on Freeside's development. One of the things about that game is that it would have been a lot different if it was PC only. We had a lot of plans early on, like here's where the water is stored, here's where the farms are, here's where the government is centralized. We had it all planned out, it wasn't just a bunch of random stuff. Then we had to get the whole thing of how the factions interact with each other, even how does the water get here, because that's important. Those are things a lot of people don't think about. We could have gone further with that. We had to simplify so we had less stuff that would bog down the game engine. In fact, it was in making sure the game worked on console that led to Freeside and the suburbs around Vegas being broken up into its own zone. It just would not have run otherwise. 
Unfortunately, it is a simple fact of modern game creation that developers go into a project with hundreds of ideas in their head, but have to scale things back in order to make it, you know, work. Additionally, some things might sound like a good idea, only to turn out awful when implemented. These typical design problems were exasperated for New Vegas' team because of the tight 18-month window they had to ship the game. Even splitting Freeside into multiple areas wasn't enough though. To circumvent this, the developers created a performance-friendly spawning system for NPCs. When the player approached a trigger, nearby NPCs would be enabled, while NPCs that were further away and outside the player's line of sight would be disabled. In this way, there would be the illusion of a populated city, but without the performance cost of one. There are still four unused markers using the prefix SP, which likely stood for spawn point and would have spawned NPCs as needed. It seems the system created its own issues though. The player could potentially chase an NPC past a trigger, disabling them in the middle of a battle. Having an NPC disappear right in front of you isn't very immersive, and this idea was soon abandoned. With the game's release date looming and the area still unplayable, the developers resorted to cutting a significant number of NPCs. Travelers were meant to spawn at both entrances to Freeside before making their way to the Strip Gate or stopping at the Atomic Wrangler. This would explain where the gamblers on the Strip were coming from and would have made both areas more immersive. They would spawn randomly from a pool of characters, including a husband and wife, a gambler protected by a bodyguard, and an unprotected gambler. The code for this spawning system is still in-game, but it's relying on Freeside being a single area and is subsequently disabled. Desperate squatters would also spawn randomly from this pool of characters, and they'd make a break for the strip before getting shot down by Securitrons. In the final game, this event only occurs once while talking to Old Ben. Famously, the faction for NPCs who are allowed to pass through the gate peacefully is called Don't Taze Me Bro. By the East Gate, there are two bodyguards the player can hire to protect them. There was meant to be an additional bodyguard here, and three more unique bodyguards by the East Gate, but they're all disabled. The King's bodyguard is missing his dialogue, but the other bodyguards have lines where they would have advertised their services to the player. The gamblers constantly spawning at the nearby gate would have explained what they were doing here in the first place. The official guide mentions these bodyguards would protect the player from pickpockets, which is very interesting. It's interesting because pickpockets were once planned to appear in Freeside. There are references to two cut pickpockets, Roger the Codger and Bitter Bob, and both have variables for stealing from the player. A faction was created for them, but the actual NPCs are missing. Their dialogue was written, but unfortunately never recorded. It was meant to play as they robbed the player, and they would have said lines like, Afternoon, friend. Good day, sir. Excuse me, coming through. Get out of the way, chump. Move, lard ass. And of course, scoot your boots, you bum. It's unknown exactly how pickpockets would have functioned, but perhaps it would have made hiring a bodyguard worth the caps. There's three unused NPCs called beggars. There's an idol marker that would make them stand around the east gate and beg the player and other NPCs for caps. Their dialogue was never written, so they were likely cut early in development. There are 11 variations of Freeside locals, each with a unique look and their own voice actor, but in the final game, only two of them appear. Even worse, nearly all of their dialogue is broken due to a series of oversights, meaning the majority of their lines can never be heard. Try sleeping with that lucky 38 all lit up above you. Just try. I hear that woman can kill with her eyes. Stay away from me. Your lady friend needs to lighten up. Better watch out. I hear Rex likes to eat his owners. Why do you think the king was so eager to give him away? That's one ragged ghoul you've got with you. Seems like a good guy, though. 
That ghoul with you looks like he's older than the war. My, the things he must have seen. Oh no, I hear those things eat people! Stay back, freak! Odd company you keep. I thought all super mutants were crazed cannibals. Weird robot. I don't think I've ever seen one of those before. Business and luck don't often go hand in hand in the Mojave. Watch your back. That looks like one of those spy bots I hear House has been secretly releasing at night. You're not doing yourself a favor by having him tag along. NCR aren't welcome here. I hear that guy has hundreds of kills. Not all of them deserving of death. I always thought there was more to Arcade than met the eye. I bet he'll do great things without the followers holding him back. We don't take kindly to your type around these parts. Witch! Witch! You should be burned for all the people you've turned into newts! Baby killer! Don't deny it. They told me you mowed down an entire orphanage on a dare. Necrophiliac, I heard about those corpses you dug up. Stay away from my grandparents, damn it! People say you practice witchcraft and dance naked in the moonlight. What the hell is wrong with you? So I hear you like picking on little kids, huh? What kind of person beats up children for their lunch money? People say you wear the skin of your enemies under your clothing. Is that true? Good? Bad? You're the one with the weapons, eh? Rumor has it you're really a possessed golem being controlled by the casinos. If this is true, where's your control crystal? Planning to kill a puppy or save some goons today? I have no idea what to believe when it comes to rumors about you. You must be insane or something. People around here think you're a bit of an enigma. Some say you like to trip old ladies crossing the street. Others say you regularly string up thugs. People just don't know what to think of you. We're all hoping you'll eventually figure out which side you're on. Thanks for everything you've done. It really means a lot. I hear you even help the local rats cross the street. People are saying you must have superpowers to have pulled off all you've done in Freeside. My friends have nothing but good things to say when your name is mentioned. It's great to see you. Word of your work around here is spreading like wildfire. Keep it up. Hey, you're the one people say has been helping out around here. Good on you. I tell my friends you're a shining example of what's good around here, but they're not so optimistic. Thanks for helping out around here. Good to see you're still around. I wish I was there to see you take Benny down. They say you single-handedly assaulted the dam and massacred everyone. That must have been quite a sight. Well, it looks like we won't have to worry about NCR or the Legion messing with us now. I just hope the Securitrons can keep the peace. Why not just put the slave collars on us yourself, you bastard? With the Legion at the dam, it won't be long before they enslave us all. You meet any of those rangers dressed up in black yet? My friends say they're mutant cyborgs and they're gonna kill us all. That new ranger armor is downright impressive. I'd hate to be on the business end of one of their revolvers. Go to hell, you two-faced bastard! Go away, you rotten bastard. Way to stab us in the back, asshole. Howdy, Doc. Strange to see you wandering around. I admire a woman who can hold her liquor. Cute to boot. She looks like she knows how to handle herself in a fight. I hope you programmed that thing to be friendly to Freesiders. Super mutant? You don't look so super to me. People say the NCR are bringing in super trooper death squads to defend the dam against the Legion. This battle's gonna be crazy. Normally, I'd say screw the NCR, but if the Legion takes the dam, I think we're all screwed. Some of my friends think the Legion is throwing a huge barbecue cookout across the river. With that much smoke rising, I believe it. Well, it looks like we won't have to worry about NCR or the Legion messing with us now. I just hope the Securitrons can keep the peace. There are ghoul variants of the local lines too, but local ghoul NPCs were never created. It looks like the Legion might be preparing for another run at the dam. This can't be good. Ah, I hope the Legion gets destroyed. If they take the dam, we'll all be slaves. Why the hate for Freeside? We're not all bad. Decisions are hard, aren't they? Uh, great. You again? I'm surprised to see Arcade venturing out of the old Mormon fort. I thought science types preferred to stay indoors. You hear about that band of crazy old ladies running around? I hear they're real vicious when they mug folks. Keep your guns to yourself, and there won't be any trouble. Leave me alone, you scumbag. The locals also have a set of alternate drunk lines, but this dialogue is set up incorrectly. 
If the lucky 38 could have been giving us power all along, why all the fuss with Hoover Dam? Good to see Rex still around and kicking. Keep your guns to yourself and there won't be any trouble. Eat shit and die. That clear enough for you? One of these days, you'll get what's coming to you. You're a real piece of work. You're one crazy bastard, you know that? I can't decide if I should shake your hand or make a run for it. I hope some of the thugs around here follow your shining example. You've been a godsend to Freeside. Can't say I like all the tin cans shuffling around, but this new Securitron army shouldn't have much trouble keeping things safer around here. It looks like the Legion might be preparing for another run at the dam. This ain't be good. Well, aren't you just special? Everybody likes the new guy but me. I'm Chubb Liver. I hear you're building quite the reputation on the strip. Don't forget about the little guys when you make it big. Don't be fooled. As soon as the Legion and NCR start fighting, the robots will invade and kill us all. There's two unused dialogue factions, locals depressed and locals angry. The factions for this dialogue were assigned to some NPCs, but the lines were never written. This reveals the locals were meant to have additional exposition about Freeside. Some characters would be given the angry lines, while others would have the depressed lines, and these demeanors would have helped distinguish the characters. There's also lines for generic children locals, but none of them are ever used. There are seven squatter NPCs that were meant to spawn at five camps spread across Freeside, but they're all disabled. These squatter camps are placed on either side of the strip gate, behind the ruins by Mick and Ralph's, beside the old Mormon fort, and by the train station. The player is sent to some of these camps during the quest GI Blues, and will find NCR mercenaries there, but the squatters the mercenaries are there to help don't actually exist. The only squatters that appear are the NPC who gets killed by Securitrons at the strip gate, and those found inside the ruined store location during GI Blues. Their dialogue conditions are totally broken though, so the few that appear there can only say a single line of their dialogue. They're disabled after the quest is completed and never seen again. Heard some more people got attacked last night. It doesn't matter if they restrict the water, we can get it elsewhere now. Heard some of the locals were attacked recently. Serves them right. Some friends of mine were attacked the other night. Someone should do something. One of these days, I'll save up enough to get out of here. One of these days. A guy I know said there's some kind of cannibal army camped out to the east. Watch yourself if you go into one of them casinos, or you'll be stuck here like the rest of us in no time. The NCR should just take this place over. Their army's big enough. The kings say they're keeping the peace, but this place is as violent as ever. Did you go over by the train station last night? Bless those people. It's almost time to head down to the train station. It's all I look forward to anymore. Hey stranger, if you're hungry, there's a man around here somewhere telling people where to get free food and water. You going over to the station tonight too? There is an entire subplot of tension between the locals of Freeside and the huge number of NCR squatters who have recently moved into the area. Dialogue mentions that the kings are actively attacking the squatters and charging them double for water. Despite this being an important thematic element, both the locals and squatters were essentially cut due to bugs slash memory restraints. It's a shame so few of these NPCs appear and that their dialogue is broken, as a huge amount of effort went into recording and writing these lines. There's an interesting NPC hidden away in the alley near the old Mormon fort. He's named Freeside Alley Corp 01, and in game his name would have displayed as Dead Squatter. He's always disabled in the final game, but I suspect he was part of a cut quest. Being named Alley Corp 01 implies there were meant to be additional dead squatters found throughout Freeside. 
Intriguingly, he's mentioned in the official guide, and it tells the player to loot him, meaning he was cut relatively late in development. During the quest King's Gambit, it's revealed the squatters are being attacked by the kings, so perhaps this is a cut remnant from that quest, or maybe it was from a different cut quest entirely. The drunks in Freeside have an unused script that cripples their legs to make them look drunk. It seems this worked at one point in development, but was later broken, perhaps due to a change in the engine. A script note reads, commenting out the leg crippling since it apparently plays a weird animation now. A unique drunk animation was then created to replace this broken version. Three additional drunks were meant to spawn near Mick and Ralph's. They have unique dialogue and would have loitered around the area as there are several unused idol markers nearby. There are six unused NPCs named Exterior King. They seemingly would have spawned out in the wasteland world space and guarded the two entrances to Freeside. Freeside's north gate is guarded by several kings, but the east gate is completely unguarded. Considering it's one of the largest settlements in the game, it's strange there's so few guards protecting it. There's an unused early version of the king's water tap guard. It's possible this was a placeholder character, or perhaps it was decided it would be more interesting if the guard was a unique character. This generic NPC was eventually replaced by Tapper. Deprecated scripts show there were two additional guards at the water pump too. There are several unused triggers near the stage in the King School of Impersonation. It's unknown what they were going to be used for, but perhaps it would have been an automated system for making random kings approach the stage and perform. It's too bad the rights to Elvis songs were so expensive, as having the king sing Elvis would have been amazing. During the quest Birds of a Feather, the player is approached by Pacer while guarding the entrance to the Silver Rush. Pacer was meant to have two kings alongside him, but they're both disabled. Despite being cut, Pacer still references them if you choose to fight him. Let's take this chump, guys. Guess you're not so good. There's also a series of cut kings that were meant to follow around a leader NPC. It's unknown if they were part of a cut quest or were simply ambient NPCs patrolling Freeside. Regardless, the kings were clearly intended to have a much stronger presence than what appears in the final game. There are three unused patients of the Followers of the Apocalypse. These patients presumably would have appeared at the Old Mormon Fort and likely could have been healed through skill checks, similar to the skill checks on wounded soldiers at Camp Forlorn Hope. This likely would have increased the player's faction reputation with the Followers. The sleeping patients that are used in the final game are spawned randomly from a list of NPCs instead. The followers and their guards also have empty bark topics. These lines would have been played randomly to the player, but were unfortunately never recorded. The followers of the apocalypse have very little content, so even minor additions like this would have gone a long way. There's an unused, unfinished script for random encounters in Freeside. Even a few additional random encounters would have really improved the area, so it's a shame there wasn't time to add them. In a scripted encounter, the player is attacked by three thugs in one of Freeside's alleys. It was originally intended to include five thugs, though. Freeside is supposedly dangerous enough to warrant hiring a bodyguard, but in the final game, it's not a particularly dangerous area. I think we can safely assume that the groups of thugs that appear randomly here were meant to spawn in even larger groups. Thugs are hostile with all of the aforementioned NPCs, so it was inevitable that they would have gotten into combat with gamblers, bodyguards, squatters, locals, etc., and this could have led to some interesting emergent gameplay. If the player has the Wild Wasteland trait and exits Cerulean Electronics, they're ambushed by a gang of old ladies called Mod's Muggers. They're named Irate Ada, Malefic Mod, and Rancorous Ruth. 
However, a fourth angry old lady was meant to appear, Caddy Clara. She was almost certainly cut for performance concerns, because it's not as if adding her makes the encounter unbalanced. There's a damaged Mr. Handy whose name uses the Freeside prefix, and it seems likely it was going to appear inside Cerulean Electronics. Perhaps the player once repaired it in a cut quest, but it's hard to say. VMS 49 Gunplay is an unused script that complicated the scene where starving children chase a giant rat. The children would have sneaked and gotten tired after prolonged running, while the rat would have stopped running after getting far enough away from them. It seems there might have even been multiple rats running around Freeside at one point. Back in the companion cut content video, I mentioned that Rex was meant to go wild and attack rats, and all of this together would have made this iconic scene even better. In the original release, there were three children chasing the rat, but one of them was removed by a patch. A subsequent patch disabled another child, leaving only one in the final game. Looking for a fix, man? I got what you need. During the quest High Times, the courier helps Bill Ronte and Jacob Hoff get over their chem addiction. These chems are sold by Dixon, a dealer outside of Mick and Ralph's. Dixon has two unused AI packages that make him travel to Bill Ronte and Jacob Hoff during the quest. This was probably cut when Freeside was split, as Jacob is found in the other world space. There's also an unused note called Followers File Bill Ronte. It reads, You quickly find a manila folder with Bill's name on it in the drawer marked N through R. This suggests the player needed to check the followers' files for additional information on Bill Ronte, and probably for Jacob Hoff as well. Perhaps this would have unlocked speech checks with lower skill requirements and made completing the quest easier. Dixon also has two bodyguards, but they're both disabled. Perhaps the most interesting part of this is that Dixon and his bodyguards have varmint rifles, but only have 22 rounds in their inventory. This reveals that the varmint rifle originally fired 22 long rifle rounds, but it was eventually changed to use 556 rounds instead. Because this change was made relatively late and their inventory was never updated, Dixon is forced to use his knife in combat. Combat with Dixon during this quest was clearly intended to be much more challenging. There were a number of other changes that further affected Freeside's appearance. The designers tried to maintain the illusion of Freeside being a single area, by placing signs, buildings, and streetlights that were visible over the walls. This was a nice touch, but these car pile walls were later patched out and replaced by taller junk walls. This change was made to hide the fact that all of the signs, streetlights, and background scenery outside the playable area was disabled. Speaking of streetlights and Freeside, if you take a closer look at them, you'll see TES-04, a reference to the Elder Scrolls Oblivion. I trust you find everything acceptable? Everything seems to be in order. Kaisar will not soon forget this. No, I imagine he won't. It's a trap! Fall back! The commander is down. During the quest Birds of a Feather, the player travels to the unmarked location Abandoned Warehouse. It seems the Abandoned Warehouse was once in a completely different part of the map, as the landscape beneath the building doesn't match the records of the adjacent area. I suspect it was once intended to be a part of Freeside, but it's definitely possible it appeared somewhere else entirely. Its interior cell uses the Freeside prefix, and every other area that uses that prefix is a part of Freeside. There's also a catwalk above the entrance that leads to an inaccessible door, and that door is completely missing on the exterior of the building. Given the layout of the building, this door placement doesn't even make sense. Very few buildings in Freeside are explorable, so having a few additional interiors would have made a big difference. 
is far as what appeared here before the building was moved is anyone's guess. In the original release, there was a wrecked bus outside of Cerulean Electronics. Despite being cut by a patch, there's still nav mesh around it. By the bus stop near Mick and Ralph's, another large prop is also nav meshed around, even though it was cut. Perhaps it was an additional wrecked car, but who knows. In the ruins across from Mick and Ralph's, there were tall concrete pillars, but these were later removed. Obsidian had to cut everywhere they could, and one trick they used was disabling the smoke effect from many of the burning barrels found throughout Freeside. This is a small detail many players likely never noticed, but it shows the links they were forced to go to just to get the area playable. The streets were covered in more litter, and there were additional bushes. More no parking signs were also placed throughout the area, and the parking areas had a unique paving texture. If you no clip through the second level exterior of the Silver Rush, you'll find this inaccessible area. It still has furniture, suggesting the player was once meant to explore it. Perhaps a cut quest or scene would have occurred here, but if so, there's no remnant of it. Several NPCs refer to the Strip Northgate as the Southgate. You look new to Freeside, so here's a little advice, friend. Don't go past the Southgate greeter without talking to it first. I can give you this tip, though. I've seen a few people go to the pawn shop, then somehow get through the Southgate to Vegas without caps. Saw a guy try to rush through the Southgate a few days ago. Nothing left but dust, you know. Its cell name is even Freeside Southgate, which makes sense, as it's a gate in the southern part of Freeside. Even further, no characters have lines referring to it as the Strip Gate North. It's likely this name change was made once it was decided there would be no fast travel point that led directly to the Strip. To emphasize Freeside's poverty, the electricity goes out every night at 11pm and doesn't return until morning. During the quest, That Lucky Old Son, the player can root power from Helios 1 to Freeside. Presumably the power was meant to stay on indefinitely if the player made this decision, but there's no code for this to happen. It really would have been a great moment of reactivity to have the light stay on all night. There were likely additional changes to Freeside as well, but there's very little early footage of the area. During my interview with area designer Robert Lee, I asked him about the cuts made to Freeside. I set up the gate guards in Freeside and the runners who got mowed down, but much of the ambient characters were created by Jesse Farrell. As we went to squeeze the game onto consoles, it became obvious the largest memory footprint was in PCs, so we had to make some hard choices. Scott Everts did his best to make the art fit, while Jesse and I trimmed the fat to save what we could of the flavor. I lucked out in that most of my characters were in the fort, Mick and Ralph's, and the Atomic Wrangler. The few that were outside, Ben and Grex, were for Wang Dang Atomic Tango, so they dodged the axe. Hey buddy, spare a cap? I can make it worth your while. There's an NPC named Rotface who sells information to the player. He has more cut dialogue than most characters have total dialogue, and an unmarked quest was once centered around him. According to the official guide, it was called Rotface's Loose Lips. After the player bought 10 tips, Rodface would use the money to buy himself a new hat, which you might recognize as Eulogy Jones' hat from Fall 3. Presumably it was meant to have a unique name, but it's still named Eulogy Jones' hat in-game. This part of the quest can occur in-game, but it requires the player to buy exactly 10 tips, exit Freeside, and then re-enter. 
In the highly likely event the player bought more or less than 10, the event isn't triggered as the counter for tracking how many tips the player has bought doesn't function properly. The remaining code for the quest was never completed, but enough remains from dialogue and scripting to tell us exactly how it would have played out. The cost of tips would now increase, and Rotface would ask the player their opinion on his new hat. Hey pal. You dig my new hat? I've been making some good money lately, and figured I'd treat myself. Exactly what I was thinking. It's nice to have a little style, you know? Yeah, it does look pretty sweet, doesn't it? Hey, screw you. Who asked you anyway? The crap I put up with. Oh uh, yeah? What would you have gotten? Yeah, that's a good idea. No sense making money and waiting for someone to just come and take it, right? Huh. You're a long-term thinker, man. I like that. You might be onto something there. Really? Wow, it never occurred to me to actually give the money away. Do people really do things like that? But you're probably here for more of my special commodity. And luckily for you, I haven't been idle since we last spoke. However, all that hard work on my part means that the price has gone up. 100 a tip now. You game. Fuck you, human. We don't all share your wonderful complexion. Some of us have to make do, you know? Yeesh, you're just all business, aren't you? Well, I like how I look, and that's what's important. Though it'd be nice if other people did too. Anyway, I was just going to tell you that I've come across some new tidbits you might find interesting. After buying the 20th tip and then returning, Rodface would have a new greeting that changed depending on the player's response to his hat. If the player had complimented the suit earlier, he'd be equipped with Eulogy Jones' suit to complete the ensemble. Hey pal, I made so much recently that I was able to afford this little number too. How do I look? You said it. With these threads, people are finally gonna start noticing me. Once again, the price of tips would also increase. The player's dialogue choices between these two conversations would then lead to four potential outcomes that would occur after buying 30 tips. If the player encouraged him to buy flashy clothes, or suggested that he should stand up to those who once pushed him around, he'd be killed by another NPC. In a previous episode, I mentioned a cut NPC named Zhao Mao. Zhao Mao is the only other NPC in New Vegas that has Eulogy Jones' suit, so perhaps he was originally involved in the quest. It's possible he killed Rotface in this potential outcome and took the suit, but it's more likely a coincidence they both used the outfit. If the player had made fun of Rotface, he'd draw you into an alleyway and attempt to rob you. The player could either give him their caps or a fuse, which would turn Rotface hostile. In the final game, the nearby alleyway is completely unused, and it likely would have happened here. If the player encouraged Rotface to get out of Freeside, he'd speak to the player and thank them before leaving the area. Perhaps he would have been disabled permanently at this point, or maybe he would have reappeared somewhere else in the Mojave. Finally, if the player suggested he should give the money away, he would join the followers of the apocalypse and reappear inside the old Mormon fort. This outcome likely would have increased the player's reputation with the followers. As a result of this being cut, Rotface is a somewhat forgettable character. This was easily one of the worst cuts in the entire game, as the quest was genuinely interesting, well-crafted, and even worse, it wasn't all that far from being completed. And since you're just about my favorite person in the world, each one is only gonna cost you a hundred caps. Interested? Look, pal, I've been thinking. I know we got off to a bad start there, but let's put it behind us, okay? You're a real piece of work, you know that? It's cool, I'm just a little touchy about people making fun of me, especially smooth skins. But you're not all bad. Take the followers, for example. Why, just the other week, one of them offered me a job. Can you imagine? Me, with a real job? 
Yeah, I bet you have. Not important enough for you to remember, huh? Hey, I thought about what you said before and picked up this sweet piece. You were right. I feel much safer. Dangerous. I like that. Maybe it's time people started being afraid of me rather than the other way around. Unfortunately, it comes with the territory around here. But being afraid sucks, no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. They'll learn that they shouldn't have messed with me. Just wait till they get what's coming to them. Oh yeah, I wanted to tell you that I got some new info for you. Each tip's gonna cost a hundred caps now though. Cause I got plans. Big plans. So what do you say? Want a tip? Oh, hey, I almost forgot to tell you I heard a few things you might be interested in. I'm kinda sorry about this, but I'm gonna have to up my price to a hundred caps per tip from now on. It's getting tougher to discover new things that might interest a traveler such as yourself. I'm sure you understand. So, you interested or what? Hey, I'm sorry about being so dismissive about your suggestion before. I thought a lot about what you said. There have been times when just a little bit of money from a stranger would have made a huge difference to me. So I get where you're coming from. Maybe I could make that kind of difference for someone else. Ah, uh, who am I kidding? You really think so, pal? I'll start looking into it. I bet I can help a lot of people around here. You're probably right. This place has been going downhill for a long time. Maybe I could start over somewhere else. Just think of it. A new life. Oh yeah, I heard some new things that you might find interesting. I'm gonna have to start charging a hundred caps per tip though. After all, I have to save up for my ticket out of here, right? So how about it? Want a tip? What? N no, I knew you were just kidding. Ha <laughs> ha, you're a funny one all right. Hey. I've been thinking a lot about what you said earlier, about saving up and leaving this dump. Do you really think it's possible? That's true. You seem to always be on the move, and it seems to be working out for you pretty well. I've already got a decent amount saved up. If I keep it up, there's no reason I shouldn't be able to go start over somewhere else soon. That's a hell of a thing to say. Build up a man's hopes, then dash them in front of him. And who says I couldn't survive just as well as you out there? People are always underestimating me. Damn. This place is a shithole. But yeah, it's home. I've lived here all my life. I'd be leaving a piece of myself behind if I left. There'd be things I'd miss. The fun of watching the kings kick the crap out of a thief. Or the look of joy on a child's face after catching a rat. Ah... Now you've got me all nostalgic-like. Maybe I'd be better off trying to find a way to make this place better than giving up and leaving. Well, look who it is. I was just thinking about you. I recently came across a piece of info that you just have to hear. And since you're my best customer, it's on the house. Interested? Well, don't wait too long. What I've got is something you'd need to act on quick. Hey, I've still got that super hot tip for you, and it's still free. What do you say? I don't want to mention it out in plain sight like this. You never know who might be listening. Follow me. Okay, pal, we're gonna do this quick and easy. I know you're loaded down with caps, judging by how much you've already given me. So I thought I'd save us both some time and just take all the caps you have. Hand them over. Man... I'm tired of scrounging for caps from ungrateful idiots like you. It's past time I moved on to bigger and better things. Now are you gonna hand over your caps, or am I gonna shoot you and take them anyway? Wow, I didn't think it would be this easy. I should have done this years ago. Guess I'll be going then. Oh, here's a final tip. Don't ever follow anyone into a dark alley in Freeside. Later, chump. Then you give me no choice. You're welcome to try. Hey, pal. I finally saved up enough caps to leave this dump, so no tips today. Or ever, I guess. <laughs> A lot of these caps came from you, so I wanted to say thanks before I shove off. 
Meeting you really changed my life. Oh, hey. Didn't think I'd see you here. I decided to stop scrounging for caps and start making a difference. The followers have been really great. There's always something that needs to be done, and everyone here treats me really well. Sorry if you stopped by my old spot looking for info. I've been so busy lately that I haven't heard anything. Anyway, feel free to stay as long as you like. I've got to get back to work. Hey, listen. I'd love to sell you some more info, but you've tapped everything I've heard lately. Come back in a few days. I'll put my ear to the ground and hopefully have heard a few more things by then. You again. You want a tip, or you here to piss me off some more? Hey, pal. You got the caps, I got the info. You do have the caps, right? The player meets Pacer guarding the entrance to the stage in the King's School of Impersonation. However, a generic bodyguard named Bodyguard King once stood watch here instead. There are dialogue topics for this generic bodyguard, but he was later cut and replaced by Pacer. During the switch, Pacer lost a large amount of his exposition, likely due to an oversight. During this initial meeting, the player could ask Pacer about getting into the strip. This would have allowed the player to ask the king about getting a passport into the strip during their first conversation. The king's dialogue for this is set up properly, but it's never flagged by Pacer's dialogue, making it inaccessible. It ain't much to look at. But this dump has something that even the strip doesn't, and that's absolute freedom. You go other places, and there's always someone screaming at you to act a certain way or to not do certain things. Freeside's not like that. Everyone here is free to do whatever they want, and I for one wouldn't want it any other way. What about it? If someone takes your stuff, you're free to take it back. If you can't, maybe you shouldn't have come to Freeside in the first place. People can do whatever they want. They just have to keep in mind what'll happen afterward. I guess you could say we don't have law so much as consequences. We do what we want, just like everybody else. We just have more guys, so other people tend to do what we want too. If somebody does something we don't like, we let them know about it. If they're strong enough not to care about us liking it, good for them. Well, the Van Graffs for one. We had a slight difference of opinion when they first showed up. Changed our minds pretty quick after a brief demonstration of how much firepower they're packing. We could probably take them, but we'd lose a lot of guys doing it. <laughs> That's old news. I had some fun with that girl that runs their operation, and then I got tired of her. So I moved on. But she don't like that, see? Normally I bet she'd just have a guy killed for doing that. But as you can see, I'm still around. Most people think it's because she doesn't want to start an all-out war with us, but that ain't it at all. She still got it bad for me. Aside from this place, there's the Atomic Wrangler just up the street. Women, gambling, booze, you name it, they got you covered. If you're more of a prude, the followers run a mission out of the old Mormon fort up toward the North Gate. Great place if you're hurt, I guess. If you like things dangerous, just past the Wrangler is the Silver Rush where the Van Graaff family peddles the weapons. Their stuff is outrageously priced, but if you want to shoot something high-tech, well, that's the best game in town. Not much to tell. We're a bunch of guys that just want to do our own thing, and anyone who's got a problem with that can shove it. I didn't join the Kings. I helped start the Kings. This whole operation you see here was put together by the King, and yours truly. You're looking to get past those tin cans at the gate, right? They let people buy all the time, if they got the caps. But if you're not rich, and I can tell you ain't, the king might be able to help you out, provided he likes you. Uh, no. We would never survive. We need to stick together. I'll go with whatever the king decides, but I'll be watching these NCR scumbags like a hawk. If they try anything... No, I won't even consider this. We'll show the NCR they can't bully us. 
During the quest GI Blues, the player helps the kings out around Freeside, and it has a notable amount that was cut from it. At the start of the quest, the player exposes Oris's bodyguard scam. After completing the quest, there was meant to be a scene where one of Oris's old clients looked to hire him again, only to be told he's long gone. So you're saying Oris isn't available? That's right. But I'm available. And I'm cheaper. But I always hire Oris. How do I know you're not trying to steal my business from him? Look, the Kings clubbed him from behind and dragged him away. I don't think missing your commission is his number one concern right now. Fine then. I guess I'll hire you. Much obliged. After exposing Oris, the player would be invited to meet the King in his room. It seems the cut bodyguard character that was replaced by Pacer would have been the NPC that told the player to meet the king. After arriving, this suggestive scene would have played out. Ah, uh, my little friend has come at last. And not me, darling, though you were doing just fine. Ladies, take five. I need to talk to my friend here. At this point, the king sends the player to check on some Freeside locals who were assaulted. These characters are named Roy, Wayne, and Ferris, which is a tip of the hat to professional wrestler Roy Wayne Ferris. After discovering they were attacked by NCR soldiers, the player can question Julie Farkas or talk to the missionaries at the squatter camps. However, it seems that Julie Farkas once traveled to the King's School of Impersonation instead. She has two unused AI packages, Meet with King and King Sweet Greeting. King Sweet Greeting suggests the King was introducing Julie Farkas to the player in his room, so it's possible this scene directly followed the cut groupie scene. Her dialogue would change if the player had already met her. It's a pleasure to meet you. I appreciate what you've done so far in the interest of peace and Freeside. We've actually already met. It's good to see you again. The following cut line suggests she didn't know who was behind the attacks on the Freeside locals. In the final game, Julie sends the player directly to Elizabeth Kieran instead. The reasons for these attacks are yet unknown. It may be possible to avoid further bloodshed. If you discover the cause at the root of this recent outbreak of violence. After speaking to Julie or questioning the missionaries, the player is sent to the ruined store to talk to Major Kieran. A script note reveals some cut ideas for the location. Maybe set up a revolving chain of customers when there's time, and have Elizabeth say a line every time a customer enters the trigger in front of her. Unfortunately, there was never time to return to the quest, and the squatters just stand around. Now it's discovered the NCR is giving out food, but only to the NCR squatters. The player then returns to the king, but while talking to him, a fight breaks out between the NCR and the kings. When the player arrives at the train station, Major Kieran and the NCR soldiers have taken a defensive position at the nearby guard tower. Several of the kings are dead, and Pacer is found cowering behind cover. From here, the player can either fight off the NCR or talk them down. However, it seems this battle was originally much different. This battle occurs in the Freeside North world space, but there are remnants of an early version of it in the original Freeside world space. There's an idol marker in front of the train station for the off-duty NCR soldiers. It's never used in the final game, and the soldiers only guard the entrance to the ruined store. By the guard tower, there's a marker called Elizabeth Kieran Tent, suggesting her tent would have appeared here, if not others for the additional soldiers as well. In the final game, there's only a single bedroll and a campfire. Near the area where the battle takes place, there are disabled mines placed beneath the ground called NCR Battle Mine. They were once a part of the battle, but after they were cut, they were disabled and moved underground. These mines were copy and pasted when Freeside was split, and as a result, they can also be found at the edge of the other Freeside world space. 
This variation of mine, called Buried Mine in the Gek, or Concealed Mine in Game, is camouflaged and would have been much easier to overlook than frag mines. Due to them being less conspicuous, they likely would have been the most dangerous type of mine. Strangely, most of the concealed mines in FNV are disabled, and only a few of them can actually be triggered. One can be found near Cook Cook in the South Vegas ruins. However, it's placed so it floats above the ground, and there's rebar clipping through it, so it's not very hidden. The remaining mines can all be found inside the Repcon test site basement near Harland. These mines aren't marked as playable, so they can never be used, and disarming them adds a frag mine to the player's inventory. Repcon test site was one of the first major areas created, so it seems the concealed mine was made early in development and then completely forgotten about. The idle marker, mines, and tent marker lead me to believe the NCR was meant to have a defensive outpost at the train station. During the quest, the soldiers appear there without any explanation though. The mines also point to the battle being on a larger scale, and some of the kings likely would have been killed by them. There's also two off-duty NCR soldiers who are noted as dead, as well as a dead version of Elizabeth Kieran. In the final game, no NCR soldiers are dead when the player arrives. Major Kieran can only be killed by the player's actions, but these unused NPCs suggest they were going to be dead already. Once the quest is completed, the food inside the ruined store was supposed to be disabled as it was seized by the kings. There's no code for this though, so it never happens. There's an inaccessible cell called Freeside NPC Dump. When many quests in Freeside are completed and the related NPCs are no longer needed, they're sometimes sent here. I'm not sure why this was used instead of disabling them, which is the way the vast majority of other quests are handled. Some of the gambler NPCs who would have traveled from Freeside to the Strip can still be found here. Interestingly, there's an NCR guard dog that was presumably cut from a quest. No NCR dogs appear in Freeside in the final game, but perhaps this dog was a part of the aforementioned battle at the train station. There are two unused endings to the quest King's Gambit. During the quest, the player is sent by Ambassador Crocker to either kill Pacer or stop the King's violence against squatters and Freeside. If the player chooses not to kill Pacer, they have the option to enlist the help of Colonel Sue at Camp McCarran or Colonel Moore at Hoover Dam. If the player enlists the help of Colonel Sue and convinces the king to end the violence, Pacer attempts to take control of the gang before being killed by NCR soldiers. However, a cut sequence once occurred where Pacer would confront the player in conversation. It would have been possible to talk him down by passing a speech check. If the player managed to do this, Pacer would later be disabled permanently, implying that he was killed by the kings for his attempted coup. Uh, we would never survive. We need to stick together. I'll go with whatever the king decides, but... I'll be watching these NCR scumbags like a hawk. If they try anything... No, I won't even consider this. We'll show the NCR they can't bully us. Alternatively, the player could convince the king to kill Pacer or tell the NCR soldiers to attack all the kings. Pacer also would have attempted this coup if the player got Colonel Moore's help, making the choice between the colonels completely redundant. It seems this version of the quest was cut to make the player's choice between Colonel Moore and Colonel Sue more meaningful. In the final game, if the player gets Moore's help, the kings are all killed. If the player gets Sue's help instead, the NCR kills Pacer and his men. The execution scene that plays out in the Silver Rush was originally much longer. For the sake of comparison, this is how it plays out in the final game. Bosses are having a meeting. You'll have to wait until it's over. Mr. Soren, please get to the point. The second half of your payment is late and I want to know why. 
Miss Van Graff, my associates and I have decided that we wish to renegotiate the terms of our deal. Might I ask for what reason? The shipment was delivered. The guns were tested before leaving this facility. Regardless, we feel that the quality of the weapons is below expectation and hope to adjust the price accordingly. Ah, I think I understand what the issue here is. Excuse me for a moment, would you? Do it. Never break faith with the Van Graffs, Mr. Soren. I expect you'll have the rest of our payment ready tomorrow morning. Okay, People everyone. Are crazy. Show's over. Back to work. Originally, Gloria would tell Jean-Baptiste to fetch the hostage who was locked in the bathroom. Jean-Baptiste, could you bring out the volunteer? This explains the presence of this otherwise unused area. As Jean-Baptiste and the hostage walked over, the hostage was meant to stop at the stairs. Jean-Baptiste would then push him down the stairs onto his face. The marker for this can still be found inside the Silver Rush. It's disabled though, and the related script reads, Commenting this out for now, needs work during Polish Week. Unfortunately, this idea was seemingly cut early and never returned to. It would then be revealed that Gloria was in a relationship with the hostage until she caught him with a prostitute at the Gamora. What is this, Miss Van Graaff? This is a lesson, Mr. Soren. A lesson in faith. I don't understand. Who is this man? What does this have to do with our deal? Everything. Up until recently, this man was an employee of mine. He's quite handsome, don't you think? I know I did. We became close. I warned him that I was a very jealous woman, and he said he understood. Apparently he didn't. Last week, I chanced upon him and Gamora being serviced by one of their two-cap whores. I was not pleased. I tell you all this because I want you to know that this man means a great deal to me. Do it. Never break faith with the Van Graffs, Mr. Soren. I expect you'll have the rest of our payment ready tomorrow morning. Okay, everyone. Show's over. Back to work. At this point, the hostage would be shot and then Mr. Soren runs away. The Van Graff guards were meant to all laugh, either after the hostage was killed or as Mr. Soren flees, but the line Van Graff laughter was never recorded. Finally, Jean-Baptiste and Gloria would have this cut exchange. <laughs> I think he wet himself before he left. That was pretty good making up that part about sleeping with Jacob. You did make that part up, right, Glory? Damn it, girl. What has Mama always said about tipping the help? I thought this was about him stealing money from us. He was stealing money, though he could have kept it for all I cared. God knows he earned it. It seems this was cut due to issues with the graphics for NPCs who have their hands tied together. If you take a look at NPCs who are tied up closely, you'll see they aren't actually tied up at all because the graphics for this are totally broken. The bonds only appear during the animation to kneel or stand back up, then magically disappear afterwards. Originally, the player's controls were disabled in this scene as well, but that apparently caused all sorts of bugs. Eventually, this scene was re-edited together into what appears in the final game. Jean-Baptiste also has an improperly set up line where the player could ask him about his siblings. This is the only mention of his sister's name in the entire game, but it's normally inaccessible. We're a wild bunch. There's my sister Frida who used to run this branch but took off to pursue the opportunity of a lifetime, as she put it. The rest are all long stories, and I don't got the time to tell them. During the quest Deck Collector, the player kills Caleb McCaffrey for the Garrett Twins. Caleb has unused AI packages that were meant to be used before the player accepted the quest. He would have slept in the player's room at the Atomic Wrangler. He was also meant to wander around and guard the building as well. It's implied that Caleb was the Garrett's debt collector before they hired the courier, so it makes sense he would have appeared there. In the final game, he only appears once the quest is started. During my interview with Robert Lee, I ask him about it. 
He was originally set up to use that room as his room before it's gifted to the player as a reward for finishing the Garrett's work. I spent some time setting up sensible AI schedules for everyone I knew would be in the building. I think originally, McCaffrey was going to draw on the player after confronted in the Wrangler, but we decided to draw the player into the strip to finish the quest. There are several cut generic prostitutes that were going to appear inside the Atomic Wrangler, and they have unused code for working. It seems these generic NPCs were replaced by the unique prostitutes found during the quest Wang Dang Atomic Tango. Fisto has a line of dialogue that never plays normally. It seems this was meant to be used in combat rather than in conversation, which is how it was set up. Exterminate. There's an empty dialogue topic titled VFS Dealer Black Widow. Presumably, this would allow a female courier to charm the Atomic Wrangler's car dealers and rig the casino games in their favor. Intrigued, I ask Robert Lee. VFS dealer Black Widow may very well have been in the game, but was cut when we ran way over budget for the game's dialogue. It was indeed intended to allow the player to charm the dealer. Finally, there's one last cut quest involving a cut companion named Betsy the Brahmin. Betsy was intended to be an homage to Fallout 2 and Fallout Tactics. During an unmarked quest in Fallout 2, the player can save Bess the Brahmin and she becomes a temporary companion. In Fault Tactics, Betsy the Brahmin is a multiplayer only character and a master of hoof to hoof fighting. Only two lines of player dialogue remain, but Betsy's code reveals the outline of her companion quest. The player would encounter her outside Freeside's North Gate inside this pen. A cut NPC named Kevin Hargrove would be found nearby and would offer to sell Betsy to the player. After buying Betsy, she joined the player as a temporary companion. Her confidence was set to cowardly, so she would always flee from combat, but her carrying capacity was twice that of other companions at 600 pounds. Each time the player slept, Code would check the number of items in Betsy's inventory. If she had more than 50 items, the player would awake to find Betsy gone and the items they had stored with her missing. Betsy would then return to Kevin Hargrove's pen, leave the player as a companion, and her name would be changed to Brahmin, hiding her identity. The player's items would then be transferred to the merchant container of another cut NPC, Tom Dooley. Despite this quest being cut, Rotface has a tip that seemingly references the character. There's a guy out on the main drag who sells secondhand adventuring gear. He's got an okay selection, but where does it come from? It's unknown how the player would have discovered what happened, but after some detective work and perhaps after seeing their items in Tom's inventory, they could have confronted the pair over the scam. At this point, the player would retrieve their stolen gear and Betsy would become a permanent companion. She certainly would have had a companion perk, but it was never implemented, so it's difficult to speculate on what its effect might have been. Going by the ID of these assets, it seems this quest was implemented late in FNV's development and there simply wasn't time to complete it. It's a shame Betsy was cut, as she would have provided an interesting alternative to Rex and Eddie. She also would have been one of the most useful companions simply due to her crazy carrying capacity. These changes would have made Freeside into one of the most impressive locations in the Fallout series. Ultimately though, all of this was left on the cutting room floor.